we're just going to start with our first hymn, which is Jesus God's Righteousness Revealed. us 
You've, you've made us your heirs and, and given us an inheritance. An inheritance that you have promised is incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away and is reserved in heaven for us. So, so Lord, help us to live in the, in the light of that truth. You've certainly blessed us with every spiritual blessing in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, help us to rest on him. Help us to trust in him regardless of the, the struggles, the evils that we see in the world around us. Lord, now we, we come together to hear from you, to hear from your word. Give us ears that are ready to hear and hearts that are ready to respond. And may the Holy Spirit that spoke your truth into existence long ago, may it speak in our hearts. Open our eyes to see the truth and help us to apply it to our own hearts and lives, that we might live as your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Returning today to Luke chapter 7. We've been working our way through the, the Gospel of Luke. And uh, if you can listen while you're turning to that, Luke chapter 7, we'll be reading verses 18 down to 35. We're thinking about the fact that Jesus is the one who has come from God to be the Savior. And therefore, it is essential that we listen and that we trust him, that we follow him in our lives. As we've been going through the, the Gospel of Luke, we've seen a number of miracles that are recorded. And these are, are to be signs to us, to point us to the reality of who Jesus really is, what his true identity is, that we would believe and be saved. Now, sometimes we may experience things in our own lives, and we may wonder why. We may be tempted to doubt. We may be questioning of why God allows these things. How, how is God loving and good? How can we see the reality of his word? We, we struggle with these things when our experience doesn't seem to match up with our expectation. We're going to see in this passage of scripture some examples, even of the person of John the Baptist, who had some questions. John chapter 7, beginning to read at verse number 18. Then the disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And that very hour, he cured many people of their infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits. And to many who were blind, he gave sight. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things that you have seen and heard, that the blind see, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And when the messengers of John had departed, he began to speak to the multitudes concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who are gorgeously apparelled and live in luxury are in king's courts. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. 
For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. And the Lord said, To what then shall I liken the men of this generation? What are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, saying, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned for you, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, He has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look, a glutton and a wine-bibber. A friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by all her children. John here has some questions. Someone that Jesus acknowledged to be more than a prophet. He says there is, there is none greater than John. He is not the kind of man who would be easily swayed. And yet... He had questions of what was happening when, when the thing that he saw wasn't what he expected. <laughs> now, we don't see it from the passage. Uh, Luke doesn't particularly mention it here, but John is in prison at this particular time. Back in chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, we were told that Herod the Tetrarch had been rebuked by John for his sin and had put John into prison. And as we see in verse number 18, where we began our reading, the disciples of John are reporting to him all of these things. Now, what are these things? Well, it's the, the reports that were mentioned in the verse just before, the reports that went throughout Judea and the surrounding regions of the miracles that Jesus was doing. The reports were coming to him that, that people were saying of Jesus that a great prophet has risen up among us and that God had visited his people. And so John's disciples are, are keeping him informed of what is taking place. But John has some questions. And he calls two of his disciples and he sends them to Jesus to, to ask Jesus a question. Are you the coming one? Are you the one that we've been expecting, or should we be looking for another? Now bear in mind, John had foretold Jesus' coming. He foretold back in chapter 3 that there was one coming who would be mightier than I. So much greater is he that I'm unworthy to stoop down and loosen the strap of his sandal. He is someone, John said, who is going to baptize with Holy Spirit and with fire. And part of the issue, I think, with John here is that, that issue of, the, of fire. Fire speaks of judgment. Remember, John was preaching to people to flee from the wrath to come. He said the axe is laid to the root of the tree, and if it's not producing good fruit, it's going to be cut down and cast into the fire. That the coming one is going to have his winnowing fan, or his, uh, some translations use the, the word uh, fork. And he's going to separate the, the wheat from the chaff and gather the wheat into his barn, and the chaff would be burned with unquenchable fire. The expectation that John has, and this was shared by the people of his generation, that the coming one was going to set everything right and judge evil. That there would be a restoration of all things. What Jesus himself refers to as the regeneration when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory and the kingdom would be restored to Israel. As I said, Jesus' own disciples had similar expectations. 
And we believe that Jesus will set up a kingdom and that he's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. He's going to judge the evil of the world and, and set everything right. But it was not yet. His coming at this point was not to, to deal with all of the evil that is out there in the world, but to provide a way of salvation. And the Bible tells us that he's coming a second time in order to reign. John didn't understand all of God's plan. Put yourself in John's shoes and maybe you'll think and you'll understand better his question. We don't know how long John had been in prison. We do know that he doesn't come out of prison alive. And Luke doesn't tell us the story, but in chapter 9, verse 7, it speaks of the fact that that Herod thought John was risen from the dead, and that he spoke of the fact that John I have beheaded. That was what ultimately happens to John. But here he is languishing in prison, wondering why isn't this coming one setting things right? Why isn't he dealing with the evil and, and setting people free? His doubt was not so much of God and, and God's plan, but, but whether Jesus was the one that he was expecting or whether there was someone else that was coming. Now, when the disciples came to Jesus with the question, the way I'm understanding the text, he doesn't immediately answer them. But he goes on doing the work that he had been sent to do. He, he continues ministering to those that are in need, and it speaks here of in that very hour, he was curing people of their infirmities and their afflictions and of evil spirits. He was giving sight to those that were blind. And after doing all of these things, and after the messengers saw what Jesus is doing, Jesus then tells the disciples of John, go and tell John what you've seen and heard. He doesn't directly answer the question saying, yes, I am the coming one. But what he points John to is the prophecies of the scriptures that had foretold that the Messiah would do these very things. We won't take the time to look them up, but, but uh, you might want to note and, and look at them for yourselves. Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 and 6. In Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, these are prophecies in the Old Testament scriptures, in the prophet Isaiah, that specifically talked of these things being fulfilled at the time of the kingdom. And what he's reminding John of is what the word of God says, and he's showing him that these prophecies are being fulfilled. And then he adds, blessed is he who is not offended, who does not stumble because of me. This was intended as, a, as an encouragement to John to trust. He reminds John of the blessing of the one who stands steadfastly in their faith. There are times when our experience will not seem to match up with what we are expecting God to do. But the answer to us is just to keep on trusting, to go back to the word. What does the word say? I may not understand why things are happening the way they are, but I trust what God said. And I trust God's promises and I, I wait upon him. God is Faithful. He's working out a plan. We don't know the details. We don't understand all, how it all fits together. We don't know everything that God is doing. But in those times, we need to wait on him. When the messengers of John departed, Jesus had a message to the crowd about John. This was not a message for John. That's why he waited till the messengers departed. He's not trying to build John up by saying good things about him. Uh, the messengers were gone. 
He had already given the message that he had for John, but he has a, a reminder to the rest of the people about John's ministry and his message. He wants them to think back about what John had told them during the time of his ministry. And he prompts them by asking a question. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? Now, in speaking about the wilderness, there's a reminder here that John's ministry was not in the population centers. John's ministry wasn't where there were lots of people, but lots of people went to where John was to hear him. And Jesus is asking them the question to make them think, why did you go out? Why did you go out to listen to this man who was in the middle of nowhere? He's in the wilderness. Why did you do that? And ultimately, what he's trying to do is reinforce the fact that John's calling and John's message was a message from God. He said, what did you go out to see? Did you go to see a, a, a reed that was shaken by the wind? Here's a rhetorical question. Obviously, whatever John was, he was not a reed that's being blown back and forth by the wind. He, he's not somebody that, that is swaying. He, he would be more like a tree that is, that is firm and steadfast. He was not the kind of person to be blown around back and forth here and there. He's not the kind of person who is vacillating, who's wavering in his convictions. He was not the kind of person who is hesitating or uncertain. And ultimately, that's the reason why John is in prison. It takes a lot of character to stand in front of the ruler and say, the relationship that you're involved in is an immoral one, and you need to repent of your sin. John was not the kind of person that, that, was, uh, he, that would try and speak words that were pleasing. He was not a people pleaser. He was above all... One who sought to please God. He was somebody who declared faithfully God's message. He was willing to speak the hard truth. To call people to repentance. He was not like a reed that was just blown here and there. So Jesus says, so what did you go out to see? Did you go out to see a man in soft clothing, someone wearing gorgeous apparel and, and living in luxury. Well, certainly that didn't describe John. Uh, the Bible tells us that he wore clothing made out of camel's hair and wore a leather belt uh, around his waist. He was a person whose diet was locusts and wild honey. People didn't go out to John in order to see the latest in fashion. He was someone who could well be described as austere. He was simple. He was rough. Without adornment. And John wasn't about living the good life and, and luxury and pleasure like those in king's courts. He had a message that was a sobering message, a message of repentance. And his own uh, dress reinforced that message. So Jesus says a third time, what did you go out to see? You didn't go out to see a, a reed blowing around. You didn't go out to see someone wearing fine clothes. A prophet. And then Jesus answers, yes, but more than a prophet. John was a prophet. He was a, a spokesman, a messenger from God. But he was more than just one of a number of other prophets. He himself was a fulfillment of a prophecy. Verse 27 says, He is the one of whom it is written. And he quotes here from the prophet Malachi. Now Malachi was the very last of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible. This is... The final message from God to his people through the prophets. And God through Malachi says, I'm going to send my messenger 
He's going to prepare your way before you. Malachi speaks of one who is coming to get people ready for the Lord's coming. It's not included in the quotation here, but Malachi continues by saying, And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the, the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, he is coming. Malachi is saying the, the, the Messiah is coming, the one who is in fact the Lord, the, the messenger of the covenant, the Messiah is coming. And that coming one would be the climax of all of history, uh, the apex, because it is the fulfillment of God's plan of salvation that, that was in view before the foundation of the world. The Savior has now come, and that underscores the importance of the place that John held, because to him was given the, the privilege of announcing the fact that the Savior had come. And Jesus says, of those born of woman, there is no greater prophet. There's none greater, not because of who he was personally, but because of the, the task that he had been given. He had been given the privilege and also the responsibility to announce the coming of the Lord. The climax of God's plan. That gives to John a sense of greatness, a sense of importance. And because of that, everyone should listen to the message that John had spoken. Jesus goes on to say, but the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. We might puzzle, how can that be that he's the greatest prophet, but the, the least one in the kingdom of God is greater? And it's because God had in mind greater and better things that lie ahead. John lived before the arrival of that kingdom. He was announcing it, he was getting things ready, but the focus is on the one who is coming and his completed work. As the writer of Hebrews says, God has provided some better thing for us. And in light of that, we who live on this side of the cross of Christ have spiritual blessings far beyond those who lived under the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. Because we partake in a new covenant that was ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ. God has made us to be in Christ. He's made us to be the, the sons of God. We have the privilege of addressing God as Abba, Father. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to lead and to guide us. John doesn't say any of this to denigrate John, but to elevate and that we would appreciate the privileges that we have who are in the kingdom of God and of Christ. When Jesus says these things, it says all of the people, and I, I understand him here to be talking about the common people, the ordinary people, because he talks about some others who had a different response. All the people and the tax collectors. Now, bear in mind, the tax collectors are viewed as the dregs of society. They're on the bottom rung of the moral ladder, if you please. That's how they were viewed in that day. But all of the people, and even the tax collectors, justified God. They, they recognized the rightness of God. They declared that God was right in what he had done. They acknowledged God's righteousness. Because they had been baptized with John's baptism. Now don't look at this as just some religious ceremony that they had gone through. For them to be baptized with John's baptism means that they accepted God, John's message. John's message was, you need to repent. You need to turn from your sin. And so these people acknowledged that they were needy. 
that they were sinners and that they needed to be cleansed. They needed to, to repent and change their heart and their minds and, and have their, their sins washed away. And baptism was simply a public admission of what had really taken place already in their hearts. They had accepted John's message as God's message, and that, of course, was the right response. It's what we all need to do, to see that we are a sinner in need of salvation. That we need cleansing. We need to be made clean. And we who live on this side of the cross understand that that's only possible because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. His blood atoned. It paid the, the price of all of our sin in order that we might stand righteous before God. But it says there were others, Pharisees and lawyers, uh, people who were experts in the Jewish scriptures, but they rejected the counsel of God because they were not baptized. They, they rejected John's message. They, they refused to hear it. They, weren't, they didn't listen to John and they didn't accept what he had to say as being from God. And as such, they refused God's will and God's purpose for their own lives. Because John really was God's messenger. He really was God's prophet. To not listen to him would be to not listen to God. And that's serious business. God's counsel, God's will for their lives was presented to them, and they turned away. I, I don't want that. Jesus, uh, Jesus speaks of their response, and he likens it to children playing in the marketplace. Kind of like playing at weddings and funerals. Those words aren't specifically mentioned here, but he talks about children who are playing together in the marketplace and some of the children complain, we, we played the flute for you. You know, there's a, a celebration, we had some lively, upbeat music, but you wouldn't dance. You, you wouldn't go along with it. We mourned. Some translations, we, we sang a dirge, but you wouldn't weep or cry. Talks about those who who wouldn't participate, who wouldn't go along. Jesus explains it this way, of their refusal to listen to the message, and they're making excuses for themselves. On the one hand, John the Baptist came, and he didn't eat bread or he didn't drink wine. As I said before, he, he lived a life that was very strict, a very austere, ascetic a life of self-denial that would have been looked on as, as rough or rigorous. And the people of his day looked at it and they said, that's, that's too strange, that's, that's not right. They didn't want to mourn and they didn't want to weep. They didn't want to be broken about their sin. They thought they were okay. They didn't really, John's message didn't really apply to them. On the flip side, this, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. Jesus was one who was engaged in, in social occasions. He took part in the feasting. Doesn't seem like he went along with the, the regular fasts that the Pharisees had ordained. And they accused him of being a glutton and an excessive drinker. Now let's be very clear here, these were false allegations. Those are things that would be sins of excess, and we know that Jesus didn't sin. The Bible tells us very plainly, in him was no sin. These things were not true. Yes, Jesus did eat and did drink. He was, in a sense, a, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But he wasn't accepting of their sinful practice. They looked at him and they said, Jesus is too tolerant. He, he accepts these people in all of their wickedness. 
See, the Pharisees and the lawyers, they didn't want to listen to God's message regardless of where it came from. When it came from John calling to people for repentance, they said, it's, it's too severe, it's too demanding, I'm not really that bad. But Jesus came loving those who were needy, loving those who were sinners, and calling them to repentance. He did call them to repentance. It's true that we come to Jesus just as I am, but he doesn't leave us just where we were. He transforms and he changes us into a new creation. But the religious leaders looked at Jesus and they said, he's not separate enough. He's too tolerant of those that are evil. And the reality is that both John and Jesus were come from God. Their life was different. Their message had different emphases, but both of them were God's messengers. But to these people, they didn't fit the expectations that they had, and so they didn't listen to the message, and that was folly. And that's the point of the last verse that we read, verse 35, but wisdom is justified by all her children. Wisdom's children are wise, and they know that her way is right. They acknowledge and declare the rightness of what wisdom does. Now, wisdom here ultimately points us to God, because wisdom comes from God. The Bible tells us God alone is wise. So wisdom's children are really God's children. And they accept the truth. They understand what is the right way. They make the right choice, and that is to hear God's message. But the fact is, there were many people who didn't listen to John. And even worse yet, there were many people who didn't listen to Jesus. And in doing so, they showed that they were not wise. The height of foolishness, the height of folly, is to reject the counsel of God for yourself. To make excuses not to accept God's messengers because they don't quite fit your preconceived expectation. That's what was happening with people in those days. The message that the Lord has for us is though we don't always understand we listen to what God is saying to us through his messengers, through his word. We have God's word. And it is important, it is essential that we listen to what God is saying. To do anything else is to live a life of folly. To turn away from what God would say to us and say, I don't accept that. I'm going to go my own way. In closing, we're going to sing him, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Here is wisdom to build your life on what Jesus has done for us. All else, the chorus says, is but sinking sand. To, to build our lives anywhere else is to fall short of what God wants for us. Let's sing together. My hope is built on nothing less. Mm -hmm.
days, when we seem like we're in the midst of an overwhelming flood. And yet, Lord, help us in those times to see our Lord Jesus as our only hope and our only stay. May we build our lives on him. May we completely trust him and rest upon him. And if there's anyone listening to this message today who has never received the truth of your word for themselves, but they, like the ones that we read about today, are rejecting your counsel, I pray that you would bring conviction to their hearts and minds, and that today might be the day when they turn to you and put their trust in you. Dismiss us now with your blessing. May your grace rest upon us and help us to live as your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.